And so we'll specifically apply this to the minimum spanning tree. And so this is another example where it, this, this uh, is borrowing techniques designed for uh, general parallel algorithms. I'm kind of showing how to, uh, how to apply these, um, how to apply these on MapReduce uh, and, and how these techniques actually make, uh, make sense uh, to do it in um, GA. Um, how these make sense to your map is. So, um, just, um, so just for you, um, you have um, this large data, which is um, broken up into um, these pieces, and you don't really have control over how they're um, broken up into these chunks. And each chunk is going to be located on this. Um, on some different machine. The, there may be replication among these, but you'll think that um, each chunk is located on a, um, on a different machine, and then each of the elements inside of each um, chunk um, so is going to be um, it represents a key value pair where you can think of the key as any sort of identifier and the value as the amount of information, this is, is quite flexible, but you want to be able to operate on each of these individually to start off with. Um, and so then you're going to have some, uh, um, some map phase, which is going to go from each um, key value um, pair. Um, it's going to create some set of these key um, value pairs. Okay, so it's, it's going to create the set, and it's going to do it so the keys are somehow capturing the information that you want to move onto the same spot, and, the, and, the, and, the, and then the values is the rest of the information you might want to do something with. Um, so then um, you're going to have, in between there's going to be some, um, uh, some magical shuffle phase, which works in the background. And then you're going to have a reduce phase where you're going to have as the input some keys, and this will be true for each of the keys. And you're going to have a set of these values. Um, and you're going to somehow, for each key and all the values, you then have them all on the same machine, and you can do some operation on them. And again, your output is going to be um, some set of keys and values. Um, and you're going to write these back to disk. Okay, so um, th th this is how the basic operation works. We're um, going to be kind of restricted to look at things in these small pieces, um, and we can only move them together using these um, by shuffling things so things with the same key wind up on the, on the same machine. Um, but it turns out, um, but the, recall the, the reason why this works so well is it's typically very simple to write each of these map and reduce operations, and it's very um, robust to if nodes fail or um, if something goes wrong in the large cluster of computers you have, the, the back end will somehow easily recover, and it will automatically do the shuffling and try and do the load balancing for you. But you don't want something where one key has a huge number of values associated with it. Um, this is going to be um, take too much time just to process this one. So you still need some, some algorithmic design. You can do a couple of rounds of this, but you don't want too many of these rounds. Again, this will take too long. So our, our constraints, we're going to be limit the number of rounds and not have too much information associated with each of these, um, with each of these keys. Okay, so one way that um, of trying to formalize this in a way that's, um, that's fairly simple, and I will, um, um, is, is what's called this MRC model, um, that I talked, I talked about this 
last week on Friday, and then there was another model which went to a bit more depth of, of how to uh, how to measure the cost. But this this MRC model makes a few looser restrictions. It says n is the um, total size of the data, d, um, and then it it makes a couple of um, restrictions of your algorithms. Um, you, you want to have at most n to the 1 minus epsilon um, um, memory on each machine. So we'll set this to be some value m. So we'll use this as a, we'll kind of use this m as a parameter, right? So this is saying it's some polynomial. This is for our epsilon a constant, which is going to be um, greater than zero, um, and probably one is probably has to be greater than epsilon. Um, so this could be some some polynomial fraction, like a square root of the data. So if epsilon is one half, then a square root of the data can fit on any one machine. This is basically saying, but you can't fit, this basically is so you can't fit all the data on one machine. So you can't just send stuff to one machine and then work on it there. Um, so this is forcing you to need to do some parallel operations. That's what this requirement is. But if we didn't want to do parallel operations, we wouldn't be doing that reduce anyway, so it doesn't cost us much. Right, if you could fit all the data on one machine, then say, well, let's then let's avoid this whole MapReduce thing, put it on that one machine's memory and solve it in one. Right, so that's what this restriction is saying. Um, what, what is, is epsilon just something that we choose arbitrarily? Or? <laughs> the, you know, it's going to depend on what, what the memory is on, on your machine. Right, so say you have four gigs of memory, um, and uh, the total data set is, you know, uh, um, it's going to be a terabyte of data. Then you can figure out what epsilon is going to be. Um, let's see if you have a... So I, I'm not sure what that, but probably if epsilon was one half, then it would fit. Um, so, um, so, so, um, this is, so we're going to say you have at at most O of n to the two minus two epsilon um, machines. So you you basically. Um, so you, so you basically can't um, have have a um, no wait you have it sorry you have at most n one minus epsilon machines so again you don't have this you know um, billions of machines you have maybe on the order of something like thousands of machines um, but uh, it's again you don't have one machine for each each data this is um, and that the um, um, let's see, and then that uh, the shuffle um, step is going to be at most n two minus two epsilon. So the amount of data moved on the shuffle, um, so the total output of every map step, so all of these, is going to be at most at most this, which is basically. You, you can send the, the, the memory of every machine to every other machine. Um, um, so this seems like a lot. These seems like pretty pretty loose bounds here, but that's, um, they wanted to put some sort of restriction that you could make the shuffle step too big or the, the machines too big. We'll see, I'll talk about another um, kind of more restrictive model that you can do some similar things in on, um, on Friday, that puts even more restrictions on the. Um, it fixes the number of machines, and then it, um, or it says for any number of machines, the shuffle, the, the amount of sh shuffle step is the sum of. Yeah, so this means the shuffle step is at most the sum of the amount of memory on each machine. So this is the amount of memory times the number of machines. So it says the shuffle step is at most every machine sends its memory out once or. It, the, the, the total amount of data sent can fit on all the machines in some sense. Although it doesn't enforce that as a, 
yeah. How well does the reduce adapt if uh, not all of them, if some of the machines are more capable than others? Is there, is there a way of it somehow informing the uh, master controller of that fact and, and giving slightly bigger jobs to the more capable machines? Um, so you can try and do that, and if it assigns something to a machine that is taking too long to finish, it will eventually reassign it to machines which are happy. Um, so it, 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 it well, at least if it, so part of the issue is if you don't know a machine is slow for some other reason, it's running a, some background job, which is taking a long time, um, then you, you may not know this. It will automatically eventually figure this out, but it may take some delay too. I, I believe you can, uh, do you know if, if you can specify uh, some machines are faster than others. I guess the the the, the, the cluster um, that you have used of all the machines the same. Yeah, they're all the same. Yeah. I, I think every data center at Berkeley that they have thousands of machines. Usually, there's at least one upgrade cycle underway. And right. Right. Yeah. So in principle, it should be pretty flexible for that. I don't know exactly how you would do that, but I, like I would be surprised if they didn't have that. Um, okay, so I, I'm just going to pause now. Um, if you if you have not turned in a project report or talked to me about your partial to the project by Friday, it will be considered uh, uh, it will officially be considered late at that point. If you're here for the review session, it's been moved to down the hall. Uh, 3515. Um, so, uh, so so if you if you haven't. Uh, gotten your intermediate report approved, do it by Friday. Um, and that just applies to the three credit students? Yes, only the three credit students. If you're one, one credit, you're probably fine, but I still need some, some scribe notes from people. Um, okay, so, um, so so is this, this model makes, uh, makes sense to people? Any questions on, on the on the general um, map just before I dive into um, the set techniques. Okay, so we're going to be talking about this technique um, called filtering. And the idea is to go in a, you're going to have a, um, a series of, um, of rounds. And you, you're going to, um, drop um, um, so, so, some large amount of data each round. Um, so, right. so, so if you're here for the review session, go to 3515. <laughs> So, so, uh, um, so, so it's going to do a series of rounds. Each round will drop a bunch of data that's not needed for the solution. Okay, so what's going to happen is if the, the output, um, and so um, um, eventually all data um, will fit on one machine. So once if you're dropping data every round, eventually it's going to fit on one machine. Um, and then you can just solve it on that machine without worrying about it being a pair. Okay? So um, so um, for this work, it's it's important that you have some assumption like this where the memory on each machine is going to be some essentially like a polynomial of the total size. If the if the if the um, if the memory is is too is too small, then the total answer you get may never fit on one machine. So this may never make sense. Um, and you also um, so so in particular, we're going to be looking at problems on graphs. And I'll talk about I'll focus on the MST, which is kind of the best simplest example. 
Um, so we're, we're going to look at these graphs where it's going to be, you know, um, a set of vertices and a set of edges, where we're going to say that the set of vertices is of size n, which is a little n that's going to be smaller than the big n, the total data. The set of edges is going to be m, which is going to be um, roughly O of n to the 1 plus c. And this is basically um, going to be our data size. There are going to be many more edges than there are going to be vertices. Um, and we're going to assume that it's O of n to you know, 1 plus c. So c, so c is now going to be um, somewhere between 1 and 2. Um, typically, c is actually going to be um, in between 0 0.08 and 0 0.5. As we, um, I think it was uh, last week Wednesday, I discussed uh, so some properties of graphs, and usually it's some, some, some polynomial in between here. But it's, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as it's less than 2, it's going to be some, some constant. Um, and so th this is going to dominate the size of the data, all the connections in the graph. And we're going to assume um, that, um, that epsilon is less than c. Okay, this epsilon, um, or that, let's see, not this epsilon, that, uh, um, I was going to write that. How did we define c again? N of, so c is with some constant and it's some property of the graph. Let me figure out what we want to say. Um, so, I'm going to say that. Which are and which are less than signs. If my glasses are fooling me, I, I apologize. Yeah, all right. So, so, sorry. So the C is nice and round, and these are nice and pointy. Thanks. <laughs> So we want, so I want to relate this to epsilon. Uh, okay, so what we want is that um, n to the 1 minus epsilon, this is going to be the size of our memory. This is going to be um, that n, the small n, is, is going to be less than this. Okay? So what we need to do is assume that the number of vertices will fit on one machine. Okay? So if we don't have this assumption, this technique this technique in general is not going to work. But can you repeat the condition? What, what is capital N? So capital N is going to be the size of kind of roughly the size of all the data. Okay. Right? So the full data says of size capital N. And we're going to have the number of number of vertices. We're going to say that this is less than n to the one minus epsilon. And this is this is equal to here, this is the parameter m, which is the size of the memory of one machine, right? So remember, um, the memory on each machine is going to be this capital M, right? So, so th this means that we can fit all the vertices on one machine. Um, so if you think of, um, so, um, so, so. The, the, this may be hard to do with extremely large graphs like Facebook, where you have like a billion, um, like it, if you have a billion vertices, this might be hard to fit all of those vertices. All the people would be a vertex in the Facebook graph, and uh, the edges may be the connections between them. They've commented on someone else's post, they're friends with someone else. <laughs> These are the sort of connections which rep might represent the edges. Um, 
But if you don't have Facebook, if you have something on the, you know, you know, even for a very powerful machine, you may be able to represent all, you just need an index. You don't need to store something for each of them. You just need to store, um, you know, a, a, an ID for each of the people. Um, so, so, um, so, so if you, uh, um, uh, uh, so, 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 so if your graph is only, if, you know, um, some number of million, it should be okay. Um, if it's if it's billions, you maybe can still do it. Um, all right. So so, um, but if you don't if you don't have this 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 property, then you're applying, you're not going to be able to eventually get all the data from the machine because you're going to need um, something to represent something for each of the the vertices. So for instance, we're going to look at the problem of of the MST. Um, so this is the minimum spanning tree, right? So let me draw an example here. So we're going to have a bunch of these these vertices, and between and between some of the vertices, we're going to have edges. And you can think of these. You can either have these edges have weights or not, right? This can have a weight of three. This can have a weight of ten. Um, this is twelve. This five, this seven, this four, this uh, twenty, this eighteen. Right. So, so this could be the input graph. Um, and you think with with some number of vertices, you can have many more edges than you have vertices. And then the the minimum spanning tree, if you don't remember, is the is going to be the set of edges which connects all the vertices that has the smallest total weight. All right, so let's see, I can have three, five, probably seven, and four, and I've connected all the vertices. Um, so it's uh, in, so, so, so one, um, the, the property, the main property that we need of this is the, the MST, has no um, has no cycles, so it's always going to be a tree. So if there are, if a cycle, that means there's more than one way to, to to get between two nodes, right? If I had connected here, then to get from this node to this node, I could have gone this route or through this extra edge as well, and that'd be it. And that would also mean that there's a cycle. But we only need to get them connected, so there will be no cycles in this tree. The assumption being. Uh, yeah, so we'll assume all the edge weights are larger than zero, or you can even just not worry about the um, not worry about the edge weights. Have each of, of weight one, and you just find some some way of connecting all the nodes. That's a trick. So no cycles. In LinkedIn, actually, it shows like when I search for someone, it shows the, uh, how much distance is there between me and them. Is it something similar to that? Well, so. You know, it's not always a great estimate of that, right? So let's say the distance between these two nodes is 10. But if I look in the MST, it's going um, to be 19, right? So the estimate may end up being way off. But it shows that it's connected and it's the closest way to, to connect all these nodes, right? So, this, so let's say you had a, a bunch of cities in the forest and you wanted to pave roads between them. But you didn't want to pave any more roads than you needed to. You want to connect all the cities, so the MST is the shortest way to do it, as long as any road is a straight line between the cities. There's something called like a Steiner uh, forest where you can go through points which are not direct connections and make it a little faster roads. Not worry about it. Um, so the, there's also something known as a um, as a minimum standing forest, and so th this is um, so th this is. Um, minimum um, spanning um, forest. And so a forest is going to be a set of trees. So th this is in case the input looks um, something like like this, and it's not connected. There's no minimum spanning tree. 
but a minimum spanning force will be um, connecting all the connected components with the minimum spanning tree. Okay. So, um, uh, is this a diagram we're talking about, or a uh, simple graph? Um, this is undirected. Okay. So we're not worrying about direction effects. Um, okay. So. So, so to simplify analysis, I think in my notes I used epsilon in a couple of different ways. I'm going to say that that uh, that m is going to be n to some power gamma. Okay, uh, or let's see, one, one plus gamma. Okay, so, uh, um, so this should be true. You should be able to solve for gamma as a function of, of epsilon here. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to do this on the fly. Um, all right, so, so so now our goal is to take some so, some very large graph which does not fit on on any one machine, but you can fit all the vertices on, on one machine, um, and we want to find the, the minimum spanning tree of this graph. Okay. And we're going to do this in. Um, under the MRC model with the constant number of nodes. Okay, so so, um, um, so so any idea? Um, so any idea how to do this? Yeah, we can take a vertex and then by greedy algorithm we can find the least edge, and then like uh, the next we can. Once we have one edge from there, we can go to the from there we can go to the nearest nearest edge. Yeah. Right. So if you have if you have a vertex and you have all of its edges, right, then you know that it's a uh, um, it's it's a uh, I, I believe you know that it's it's lightest edge must be in the minimum spanning tree, right? Um, um, but what you don't know is if you can throw any of those edges away. Right? It could be that you have a graph where there's one edge connecting here, and this one has weight 1,000, this one has weight 3, this one has weight 2. If you're sitting at this vertex, and you see these three edges, you think, OK, I'd like to do something like this filtering where I can throw away data. I'd like to be able to throw away some of its edges. I want to throw away this edge of weight 1,000. But actually, I can't do that. That's the only edge which is connecting these two parts of the graph. So I can't, I can't throw away no, uh, any of the edges by, by looking at a vertex and, and, and just, it's, it's, uh, and, and just um, all the edges associated with that vertex. That's not enough information for me to do this. So. If there is any other edge crossing, then we can choose that. Right, right. OK, so let's say. Let's say that there was another edge. This was weight two, and this was weight five. You can choose five rather than thousand here. Great. So now, if I had if I had these three nodes together, I know I can throw away a thousand, right? Because there's a cycle, and I, and I had all these edges, right? So I had all these edges. There's a cycle here. And I can throw away the largest edge in any cycle. Right? So it has, has no cycles, and so I know I can always throw away the largest edge. So, so if I did have these three edges, I could do this. So that's great. So, so we want to do something like this, but we can't look at sets of three at a time because the cycles may be um, the, the, the cycles may be uh, much larger than three. Um, so we want to find, you know, be able to find all possible cycles and, and throw these away. 
Um, and, and also, if you looked at every set of three, this would um, uh, on this may also be too many. Um, okay, so. <coughs> Okay, so, so what, we, what we're going to do, we're going to describe one round of map reuse, and this will be one of the rounds in this filtering step. And in this, between the map and the reduce, we somehow want to be able to throw away a large number of edges. Okay? So, I, I somehow want to, and I can't put too many edges on on one machine, but basically I want to put as many edges as I can on, on one machine. And that will help me find the most number of cycles. Right? So I, I want to... Um, um, partition E into um, E1 to up to EK. And I want... Um, I want k to be roughly one half times uh, the total number of edges that I have over m. Okay, so, so basically what I'm doing is I'm, um, if I make this to be k, then I want each of these, these edge sets that I have, each edge i, um, so I want each edge set i, um, the size of this, to be roughly one half times the size of my memory. And remember, this is going to be, um, th this is going to be equal to n1 plus Okay, so I'm going to, if, if I do this, now I'm going to have some, for each, um, for, for each vertex, on average, I'm going to have about n to the gamma on different edges associated. So I'm going to have a lot more edges than I'm going to have vertices. Um, okay, so... Okay, I've described this map step kind of um, here at a pretty high level, right? But remember, I need to look at each of these. So when I store this, each of the edges is going to be one key value pair is going to be the edge, right? The, the ID, the key is not going to matter, say the value is going to be a pair of the vertices based on, uh, based on an index. Um, um, so, so how would I, how would I partition, how would I figure out how to partition these, uh, th these edges in this way? So that the total number of edges is roughly um, k, and, and I have about, and, and I, um, it is this number k, and um, I know that 1 half times m is, uh, is um, you know, I'm, I'm going to fill half the memory on each of the machines. Um, so assume that I can come in knowing the size of the memory and the number of edges I have. So assume I have those values. How would I, um, so essentially I can know what the value of k should be. Um, how would I do this? Divide by k and remainder. I've had that because we to have a pre-round of some kind Same. where we just somehow split up the graph among all the reducers and then have each reducer count the number of edges in its assigned domain. Maybe random values. Well, so, so let's say I, I know the value of k. So I know the number of edges and I know them. So I don't okay. need to count them. Um, if I need to, I can run a step to count the number of edges to start. Random values between 1 and k, just assign. Yeah, right. So, uh, it's, so I'm going to do this at random. So, and then, um, so for each um, edge in, in the edge set, I'm going to output um, I edge, where I is um, in 
the values 1 to k at random. So, so, so basically the, the key now is going to be something from 1 to k at random, and then the value will be the edge. Right, so, so I can just do this at random. Um, okay, um, and so now, um, so this is the map step. I just randomly split up the edges into roughly equal, equal sizes. Um, and then on the reduce, I want to um, compute the minimum spanning forest on um, the vertex set, which I assume I have stored everywhere, um, that I can store on each of these nodes, right? I can, I can also send it in MapReduce in the, in the map render if I need to. Um, and on this, this edge set. And so the minimum spanning force will be a subset of the edges. Um, I'm going to call this EI prime. Okay, so, so um, and so now I'll say that E prime is going to be the, the union um, of these EI primes. And so um, for E in EI prime, I'm going to um, going to write this out to memory, so I can I can put this back on disk, right? And, and so I can you know use whatever I want for the key, or maybe I'll again use here. It's going to be a random value. Um, all right. So so all I need to do on the reducer is compute the minimum spanning force. I say minimum spanning force because I don't know if all the minimum spanning tree, right? And then this is going to give me a set of edges. Okay, so um, so it's a pretty um, so so it's a pretty simple um, algorithm. Now I need to prove that this actually works, right? So do you believe that that this is going to work? So, so people understand, do, do, do you understand how the algorithm works? I'm still trying to picture what a minimum spanning forest is. Right, so um, if, remember this example here without these two nodes. Say I have these five vertices and these um, five, or this, the four red edges. The minimum spanning forest would be the three green edges. It's not a minimum spanning tree only because this set is not connected. Right, so let's say that I have other edges in my in my um, in the total set, but these did not wind up on this node. These are only the, the edges that are in EI. Right, so I don't have enough to connect the graph. Um, so I only find uh, some minimum spanning forest, which is a minimum spanning tree of each of the um, of each of the connected components. So, so, in order to show that this, this, um, so, okay, so, so I'm going to do this, and then this, um, this might not, um, this, just doing this might not finish. This is going to be one round of the filter. Okay, um, so now if the number of edges is going to be less than M, then I'm going to run the MST on, on the V on each, uh, on, on, the, on the vertices and the, the edges, sorry, E prime on um, um, one machine. Um, That's a prime right after the if e prime. Else repeat. Yes, yeah, so this is e prime. This is the e prime from the end of uh, this reduce round. So if at the end here the number of edges is small if it fits on one machine, then I, I can essentially run this map round again 
and I can recalculate this, this, this let's say I know this value k. Um, and I'll, I'll describe why after the first round you can kind of basically know what this value k should be. Um, if the value k is going to be 1, or is less than 1, right, so, so this needs probably to have a ceiling. So this needs to be an integer, right? So if, if this value k is less than 1, then basically in this step, every random value I get is going to be a value 1, and I'll send everything to the same machine. I run the minimum spanning forest, which it'll be, hopefully it'll be connected if I've done everything correctly, which I'll show, and then the output will be the minimum spanning tree and I'll be done. If not, then I will repeat and um, with a new value of k. Why is this? Size of the e i approximately one half n. Um, I just wrote it down. It's not right. So, so I'm going to set. So, so what I wanted. Ah, so this needs. Here, I should be a two here. Yeah. I had it. I had it in my notes as a. As a two from before, and I changed it to one half now. But I should have yeah, been it. What? It still didn't change. Hmm? It still didn't change. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so this should be this should be two here. Yeah. Um. And uh. So um. So <laughs> um. So this should be two, and then the expected size of each of these sets is going to be one half. Now. Um, so none of this will be on the test. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so to prove this works, um, I want to show that A, this, Um, so this was going to get the correct MST. Um, it's, it, it's going to finish in a constant number of rounds. And that the other condition I need is that um, EI, each of these EIs is going to be less than M um, with high probability. So there's randomization in how I choose these eyes, and I need to show that this works. So this whole algorithm computes the minimum of spanning tree of our original data set. Correct. Um, so I, I still want to still want to <coughs> prove that to you. Um, how does this help us filter? Well, the, the, the filtering here is that at each, so in, in each of these reduced steps, I take in a set EI and I output a set EI prime. Okay? This EI prime is going to be um, much smaller than EI, and I'll show that um, in, in part B here. And so, so I'm throwing away all the edges which are non EI prime, I don't need any more. That's, that's the graph. And one more is saying the starting was the graph was connected. Yeah, yeah. So, so assume it uh, um, gives a correct MSC, assume it's connected. If it's not connected, it will give the correct minimum spending force. Okay. On point C there, what's the last word that the control C? Um, it's WHP, it stands for with high probability. Okay. Now I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain what that is. That means a little bit. Um, it's a it's a technical term for um, when you deal with randomized algorithms. Um, okay. Um, okay. You're you're saying that there's a uh, one in a Google Flex chance that we might need a ridiculous number of rounds to. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll define what that means precisely. Okay. Um, actually, it won't be on the number of rounds. It'll be on the size. The number of edges I assign to the machine. 
Um, so so I'll, 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 I'll talk about that. That's um, OK. Can I ask Yeah. So I know that you compute this minimum spending force and reduce them. How do you come back to the E prime? How do you come back to what? E prime. So E prime is just it's, it's just going to be union the prime. union of all of them. So I don't I don't need it at the end of the reduced step. This is just for notation. Okay. So 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 actually I, I have this if condition. If the size of E prime is less than M, then then I'm going to be done. So I'll 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 tell you how I will know K after each of the after each step when I get here. So let's let's first look at the at the correctness. And so this so I will run. Repeat this on the next round on the uh, on, on only the E prime in the next round. So I so I I just have thrown away. I'm not going to use in the in the rounds that come after this. Okay. So so I'm going to use this property that the MST has no cycles, and in fact, if you have a weighted graph, if you do find a cycle, you can throw away the you can throw away the largest weighted edge in that cycle. Right, so if I have this graph and I added and I looked at this node 10, it's the largest weighted, it would be the largest weighted edge in the cycle. So I can throw that away. That's a that's a property of the MS. Okay, so um, it's also the property of the minimum spanning force. The minimum spanning force is the MST in each of the on, on each of um, the connected components. So what can I say about the edges I'm throwing away here? I'm only throwing away an edge if it was part of if it was part of a cycle and it was the longest edge in that cycle, right? So it it, it could have been that I only had edges. Um, you know, so let's draw an example here. Uh, Um, okay, so, so let's say this was my um, this was my original graph. So now let me draw the, the edges which are in EI, which are going to be in blue. Right? I'm not going to get all of the edges. I'm going to get these edges here. Okay? So, so let me, instead of this one, let me assume I have this one here. So, so then if I look at this node, I'm going to have its view of the world, it's going to see all of the, all of the vertices, because it can store all of those, and it's going to see these edges. So these are the only edges it sees. Now it knows that it can throw away this edge, because there's a cycle here, and th this is the longest edge in the cycle. So the minimum spanning force it computes is, is going to be this. So these are, the green edges are going to be EI prime. And in fact, every edge that it throws away is going to be part of a cycle and is going to be the, the highest weighted edge in that cycle. And those edges, even if I had the other edges in the full set, are still not going to be part of the minimum spanning tree. So it's safe to throw those away. So I've only thrown away edges which are not part of the minimum spanning tree. Okay, and... Uh Computing the cycle is easy because all the edges are in one machine. Like uh, yeah, right. So I can run, I, I can run an algorithm in RAM on side of the reducer. I because everything had the same key value, so I have those all at once. And I assume that these values were not too big that they could fit in my memory. So it fits in memory. I don't need to worry about IO efficient algorithms. I can run some in memory algorithm, and there are some. You know, fairly efficient hours for computing the MST. So, so, so I run one of these MS uh, T or minimum spanning forest algorithms on my data set. And I output this edge set E, and let, so let's say that 
the output of this round is going to be these edges from one of the from one of the nodes. The other node, let's say, got the other edges, and it's going to um, keep four, three, and seven. Right? Eight would have made a cycle. So I, I'm, at the end, I'm going to have these 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 green edges, and maybe these now fit in memory, the green edges, and so then I can, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six of them, there are only five, five nodes. Now I run the minimum spanning tree on here, and I end up throwing away these, these two edges, because both of these form long, long cycles. And then the output is going to be correct. At first, we need to partition E into two equal parts. Yeah. Uh, in that example, uh, which one is E1, which one is E1? Uh, so so the, this is going to set E1. So this is going to be E1. And then, just to be clear, um, E2 is then going to be It's going to be this set. So, so, so this is going to be E2, and the output of E2 is then going to be this minimum spanning forest. There are no edges connected here, but it's its own connected component. So this is, and then the green one is E2 prime, and this the green one is E1 prime. Some question with the notation here, where we did, did this the second line from the bottom. M MST V E prime or just V? What the difference between these two terms? With the V and E prime? Yeah, this is E prime. What's, yes. the, what's the other guy? It's um. E A prime. These are still. So here I'm running the MST on, on V E prime. Right, so the same, all the vertices, but only the edge set that um, survived each of these reducers. Right, so that's, I, I wrote this here only, only for, um, basically, like only for notation, so I could write this. But, but really, you'd one, run one more round, and that would, the mapper would put them all in the same reducer automatically, um, if you knew what the value k is. Yes? Yeah. Uh, uh, all the edges all together is still not a minimum spanning tree, right? I mean, there's no guarantee it is minimum. It's a superset of the minimum spanning tree. I've never thrown okay. out an edge which is part of the minimum spanning tree. Okay. And the number of edges, well, I guess I need to show the number of edges always decreases. Yes. Um, but I'll sh show that here. Um, so the other property is the minimum spanning forest always has at most n minus 1 edges. Um, you, if you have more than n minus one edges, it's no longer a tree, right? And a forest is a s set of trees. So if you have two components, then it's going to be n minus two. Um, so so it's it's going to be the, the the proof for this is in in, in two parts. It um, never throws out edge in um, the True MST and and uh, E prime I is always less than less than or equal to n minus one. Right? So the edges always decrease. So if the edges always decrease, eventually it'll fit in memory and I can I can run the MST on edges which much must include every edge in the MST, so it will find the true MST. Okay, so let me show how it finishes in a constant number of rounds then. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> just yeah. sanity check before you do that. Um, the reason we have to do a final round on just one machine is to guard against the possibility that there's a path and somehow enough of the path never ended up on the same reducer uh, for the path to have been detected so far. Yeah, that's right. So, so if you look at this example, let's say that that e prime here equals 
E1 prime union E2 prime. And let's say E, e prime, the size of this is less than M. So I'm, I'm not done yet. I still have two extra edges. This edge 6 here and the edge 7 are edges I don't need. So I need to do one more round on just these edges to get to throw away edges 6 and 7. Okay, so, so let me show that it finishes a constant of rounds. Okay, so the, I, I'm going to use now, remember the notation initially, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say E, um, so is the size of E, remember it was going to be n to the 1 plus c, and the memory size is going to be n to the 1 plus gamma, and gamma is going to be less than c. And so these are both going to be, going to be constants. Okay, so um, the, the size of, of E prime is going to be less than k times, times n minus 1. Right? There were k of these different sets I've broken into, and each edge set is going to be less than or equal to size n minus 1, because a minimum span entry can have at most um, one edge reach vertex, um, and one less than that. Otherwise, there would be some cycles in this. Okay, and now we can look at k. So this is roughly going to be um, the original um, number of edges over m times n. And so remember the original number of edges, this was going to be n to the 1 plus c over n to the 1 plus gamma times n. And so, so I can do some, uh, and this is going to be n to the 1 um, plus c plus 1 minus 1 plus gamma plus e. You know, just so you see is 1 uh, plus c minus gamma. Okay, so what's happened is if c is and gamma are both the constants, let's say, for instance, that c is equal to um, 0 0.5 and gamma is equal to 0 0.1. Okay, so now I have n to the 1.4 after one round. It's decreased by a polynomial factor. It's gone from n to the um, 1.5 to the n to the 1.4 number of edges. Okay, so what's going to happen after the next round? So let's say that this is I said 0 and that E prime, this is equal to, well, or let's say that this is M0 is the number of edges initially. This is equal to M1. Then how big can I say is M2, which is going to be the number of edges after the end of, end of the second round? I'm again going to split up into K, but now K is going to be m1 over this uppercase m, right? So now the n1 plus c is now n to the 1 plus c minus gamma. And so this is going to be O of these markers. O of 1 plus uh, n1 plus c minus 2 times gamma. Okay, so the, the, that's going to mean that. Um, so after this becomes, um, this value becomes n to the 1 plus gamma, I can fit it um, on one machine. So it's going to take, um, it's gonna, that's going to take one additional round. So I'm going to need C over gamma um, 
crowns. And so, so this is also going to be equal to um, log of m base n. This is the same uh, thing that we saw before. When m is a polynomial of n, this, this, this log term is actually a constant. Both of these are constant. If this was 0.5 and this was 0.1, that means it is going to take only five rounds to do this. So typically when you're doing these things where you're dividing, um, um, like when you're doing divide and conquer, you need like a, um, a um, logarithmic number of rounds to get down to a small set where you can run your brute force operation, right? Uh, but when you're able to do these, uh, these, 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 uh, these thinning in, um, by a large um, polynomial factor each time, and the root of your, uh, the base of your log is, is, is pretty big, then this is only a constant number of rounds. So this, is only, this would work in only, in only five rounds. In many cases, in most practical settings, this would probably work in um, probably like only, only roughly three rounds. Um, Right? And so also because of this, if you know the initial value of E, of the size of the edge set, and you know what the memory size is, then you can pretty much know what the value of K is going to be at each round. So, so, so K is, is going to be, so let's say K in round I is, is going to be um, um, 2 of uh, n to the 1 plus c, um, or n to the c minus um, i times gamma. Because I've divided essentially by this factor m each, each time. So, so I can set c like this, and, and this will be a, uh, yeah. One options do we have if we inadvertently discover that our data set has, is much bigger than what could eventually be reduced onto one machine? Right, so if the number of vertices is going to be larger than M, larger than we can fit it in yeah. memory. Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a challenging problem. Um, if that's no longer the case, then this algorithm is not, is not going to work. You could get stuck with, 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 with these different pieces. What you could try doing is, see, the problem then is you need to find, you need to detect if there's a really large cycle in your, in your data set. And this has been a large, uh, so, so this paper came out, this was from a paper from 2011, and this was kind of an open problem in that paper. What happened if, um, if you have some, some graph that could totally fit in, um, that, that where the number of nodes cannot fit in memory, can you detect if there's a large cycle? Um, and there was a, there was a paper this year, I think, that, that showed how to do it. I, I, I don't, I didn't read, I didn't read the paper, so I don't, I don't remember how it works. But there, there's some algorithm someone has come up with how to solve that problem. Um, I can point you to the, I can try and point you to the paper out of class if you're interested. I mean, shouldn't there be C over gamma plus one round? C over, uh, so you actually. Because you have actually, oh, oh that's small and that's big n. Yeah, so basically you only need to get down to set of size n to the one plus gamma. So you don't need to divide it that times, but that takes an extra round. It's, um, that, you know, I, I, I might be off by one round here, yeah. um, but it's not so important. You may need a round to count the number of edges okay. initially as well. One more thing. So intuitively how I can think about this algorithm, that's how I understand it now is, okay, I give you a graph with a, vertice, with a set of vertices and a set of edges, yeah. and you randomly partition the edges. And what you basically obtain, you obtain k graphs, right? Okay, let's assume that all these graphs fit in memory, and these graphs can be connected or disconnected however they are. That's why you're interest, actually interested in whether you're computing minimal spanning tree or minimal spanning forest. Yeah. So you have this k random graphs. 
And the thing is that why are you computing now? Now you can compute minimum state for us in each of these graphs, and you can add in, uh, the, you will add in the minimal edges between the vertices. It yes. may be that in some of these you added uh, um, the edge that it's actually, that has a, a, you're pregnant, you're a larger weight than some other, than this other yeah, graph. Yeah. But, then it, but at the end you actually just join them all up together. So basically you yeah. just sample them, let's divide them, you take the minimum edges on each of these guys, and then you just join them and you take the minimum of the minimum. Oh, that's yeah. right, that's yeah. right, yep. So you can use this filtering technique to solve several other problems. You can, um, uh, there are ways to do it for finding maximal matchings yeah. in a graph, um, and for, you can approximate the minimum weight matching, I think it's like an eight approximation, using similar techniques to this, and the minimum cut, there's a way to, Kind of solve this as well. I think it's, it's a randomized algorithm. So, um, this the, the one thing I should note is that it's it's not important for the correctness or the number of rounds that I partition the edges randomly. Um, it will still work even if I do it any any way of partitioning them. The reason I do it randomly though is because. You know, otherwise I don't know how to get roughly the same number of edges on each of the each of the machines. I need this last property that the edge on each machine is less than m. So I set it so that it'd be roughly roughly m over two, roughly half the size needed. And I claim that it's no more than than size m. That means that it would accidentally get twice as many edges as it was supposed to get. Okay, so. This this works with um, this works with high probability, and what this means is that um, that the um, um, the probability of um, a failure of this algorithm is going to be less than um, one over um, you know is some some constant to the power of, um, of n, right? So, so, um, so the power of n. So, so, it's, so as if, if we assume n is large, this is, is going to be extremely small. So often people will put this so it's 1 over um, some polynomial in n. But you can actually prove this stronger property that it's some constant less than 1 to the power n. So if it's like 1 half to the n, this, you know, this is going to be a really, really small value because remember, n was something like a million. So that's a very, very, you know, very, very small chance that this would happen. Um, so I, I don't have time to go through the, the proof of this, but you can go through this by Chernoff bound. Um, I, I, I think I mentioned this earlier in class. You can show that. Um, so th this, th this law of large numbers that if you do things randomly, they, they, um, they're going to be very close to the expected value. And there's going to be some distribution where this is going to be the ex, um, expected value. And the distribution of values is going to look like this. And you the larger the number of, what? You told the name of a law, right? You told the tail of something, right? And the, the tail, yeah, if you go out, say that th this is twice the expected, expected value right here. Then um, th the probability, which is this little area under the curve past twice the expected value, is, is going to decrease um, exponentially with the number of trials that each has the right expected value. Um, so th this will, the probability that this will occur is going to decrease exponentially um, with the number of trials. And so, you know, you can formally work it out. If you look in the notes I posted online, I, I, I work this out in details. Um, but it's not, it's a pretty standard to show that randomly partition that works, works very well. You're never going to get more than twice the size if you're doing a lot of elements. And so we'll actually, I'll, I'll look at this a little bit more closely on Friday when you're doing, um, when you want to sort values. So instead of, kind of magically using the shuffle step to, in order to sort things, you want to, 
Like, it's, it's not completely obvious how you would sort using, using MapReduce. Um, the shuffle step can kind of partition things in the right order, um, but you want to make sure you get this right. So we'll talk about exactly how to do that, how, um, how the Hadoop, version of Hadoop that came out in 2009 kind of um, destroyed this, this, uh, this benchmark called TerraSort, where there's a terabyte of data that, uh, that need to be sorted, and, it, and, and Hadoop was able to do this um, extremely, uh, much faster than anything else, in only two rounds. Um, and we'll show, and we'll look a little bit more carefully at, at how that worked, and some other, um, and maybe a few other arguments. All right.